March 2nd, 1889, President Grover Cleveland signed a bill passed by both houses that officially established the National Zoo. Easily accessible by car, bus, or metro, the zoo is located between the two stops, Cleveland Park and Woodley Park Zoo. Plans for the zoo were drawn up by three extraordinary people. Samuel Langley, third secretary of Smithsonian, William Temple Hornaday, noted conservationist and head of the Smithsonian's vertebrate division, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the premier landscape architect of his day. The zoo was created by an act of Congress in 1889 for, quote, the advancement of science and the instruction and recreation of the people. Together, they designed a new zoo to exhibit animals for the public and to serve as a refuge for wildlife, such as bison and beaver, that were rapidly vanishing from North America. The area that is now American Trail features North American species and was formerly known as Beaver Valley. It got its name from a family of wild beavers that originally lived in the area of Rock Creek Park. In its first half century, the National Zoo, like most zoos around the world, focused primarily on exhibiting one or two representatives of as many exotic species as possible. Many of these species were favorite zoo animals, such as tigers and elephants, so zoo staff began to concentrate on the long-term management and conservation of entire species. Construction on the Elephant House began in September of 1902 and was completed in January of 1903. Today, it is now known as the Elephant Community Center and is an indoor exhibit located on Olmsted Walk that highlights the first-class animal husbandry and medical care that the zoo's elephants receive. This exhibit allows zoo visitors the opportunity to get an up-close view of these incredible animals and learn about zoo care, elephant psychology, cognition, and social behaviors. For eight hours every day, Elephant trainers work hard with the four Asian elephants to stimulate cognitive development while producing fun entertainment for zoo visitors. Okay. I've been here with Zoo for three years. Okay. He, is, he was nine when I got here, and he is now 12, which means he's a little bit closer to uh, teenage years, a little bit increase in testosterone. He's uh, learning more and more every year I've been here. He can do more and more things. We've uh, finished our construction of the new elephant facility, and he's incorporated new locations, new yards, and he's allowed to have access to where we're actually uh, trying to train him for artificial insemination collection. So we're taking the steps towards that. So hopefully someday, if we can't go to a zoo that has females that he can read, then hopefully we'll be able to collect from him and send those samples to elsewhere. He listens to us 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Another one of the most popular zoo animals is the giant panda. Recently, a new member of the panda family was born. Bao Bao, the cub of Mel Zhang, is only seven months old and is already attracting huge crowds of visitors. The panda cam, one of the 15 live animal feeds from the zoo, has given keepers the ability to monitor the health and development of Bao Bao and allowed people to stay updated. For more than 30 years, giant pandas have been housed at the zoo and in our hearts. The first two pandas, Sing Sing and Ling Ling, were acquired in 1972, after Nixon's historic visit to China. Eight years later, the Great Ape House was completed. Instantly, young people rushed to volunteer and pursue careers researching primates. I've been a zookeeper for five years. Yeah, uh, I work at the Great Ape House, so we do the gorillas, the orangutans, gibbons, lemurs, um, macaques, and mangabees. I love the gibbons. The gibbons are awesome. They are smaller than the apes. They have long arms. They're arboreal, which means they swing really high up in the trees. They have the cutest little noises. But I, so I'm partial to gibbons, but I love all the primates. I mean, primates are just pretty awesome. <laughs> I just fell in love with primates. They're so much like us. Um, you know, especially the great apes share anywhere from 97 to 99 percent of the same genes as we do. Mm. Their their mannerisms can be so much like us. So you just see so much of yourself in them. And while they're still primates and they're not humans, um, they're just they're just so awesome. <laughs> As a part of the zoo's goal to enhance the education of their visitors, the Think Tank was created to educate visitors about animal cognition and the scientific process through interactive experiments. So, 
So I can't ask the orangutan what's your favorite kind of food because they don't understand what I'm saying and they have no way to respond anyway. We have to figure out how to ask them that and have them tell us without using words. So we have a setup somewhat like this. We have a big tray. And when I push the tray forward to the orangutan, they know they can choose one of the things that I have put on the tray. So if I put a radish on the tray and a turnip on the tray, I push it forward, they can use their fingers to point to either the radish or the turnip, and they know that they get whatever they're pointing to. Right? So that they're showing a preference in pointing to the thing that they like more. With zookeepers constantly giving demonstrations and having easy access to knowledgeable volunteers, the public can achieve a higher level of understanding. Yeah, anytime you see someone in red, mm -hmm. a photo ask whatever you want to with them, and they'll you know, probably have 80% of the answers. <laughs> Many demonstrations can be seen around Lemur Island, which was once known as Monkey Island, built in 1986. Our guys are, um, all lemurs are from Madagascar, so... Um, it's the only place you can find them, and they're actually uh, threatened because of uh, deforestation. So this is what they're doing right now is actually super cool. This is target training. So most animals here at the zoo, to keep them safe, to do like veterinary procedures such that if they touch the red ball or whatever, mm -hmm. they will be given a piece of food. So you can imagine this is one of the ways, like for example, we need to keep up with whether or not they're eating properly so we want to weigh them. Mm -hmm. and so instead of, um, and so it's really hard to train labor to get on the scale, but if you can target train them, then you can touch the target on the scale. So our, our keepers can spend a lot of time and energy training them. A short walk away from Lemur Island is what was originally called the Reptile House. Open to the public in 1931, the indoor exhibit provides a controlled environment for amphibians and reptiles to live. Before the house was completed, animals such as American alligators used to be held in the Carnivora House, opened in 1982, which was the first permanent building in the National Zoo. Today, this building offers both indoor and outdoor exhibits for reptiles and amphibians alike. Visitors can experience exotic species at a whole new level, thanks to the 70 different glass enclosures and the Appalachian Salamander Lab, where research is conducted on hellbender salamanders. Around the same time as the Reptile Discovery Center, construction of the birdhouse was completed, and it opened in the summer of 1928. The widest variety of birds at the zoo live indoors at the birdhouse, where a series of smaller exhibits encircles a large indoor jungle, complete with free-flying tropical birds. Um, my specialty is the rat tights, which is mm -hmm. the emu, cassowary, and rias. Um, and then I also take care of the two owls that are, that are on the corner. Yeah, you know, we, some birds are coming in and out. We're actually about to undergo a renovation, so a lot of our birds inside will probably go to other zoos, and we're getting a lot of migratory birds. However, you, you can't have a, a birdhouse full of migratory birds. You have to tell the other side of the story. So the cassowary will stay. I think the emus stay. Mm -hmm. The rias are staying. And our quarry buses are staying. The, the first aviary or flying cage at the zoo was constructed in 1901. Many years later, a much larger great flight cage opened to the public in 1965, and it received an award for excellence in design by the American Iron and Steel Institute. Similar to the flying cage, Amazonia is the largest and most complex exhibit ever built at the National Zoo. Opened in 1992, this gigantic rainforest includes a tropical river and a 55,000 gallon aquarium for the display of Amazon River fish. Okay, yeah. well, um, so this is Amazonia and it's replicating what the actual Amazon basin looks like. So right now we're in the upper forest. So when you were downstairs and when you look over at the pools, that's the lower forest or the mm -hmm. flooded forest where the stingrays are, they call it. And then it's supposed to um, simulate when you come up and like you're going to the upper canopy. There's two dusky TT monkeys. They have oh. the really long tails. So this tree and the termite mound are the only two things in the exhibit in terms of living things that aren't real. Because this tree would just be too big. I mean, it, you know, you'd have to break through this canopy here. Next to the Amazonia exhibit is the Amazonia Science Gallery. This gallery includes exhibits that look at biological processes that take place in the rainforest. Since its permanent opening in April 1997, ASG has proven to be a great form of science education and a place where visitors can look at biological processes that take place in the rainforest 
and get up-to-the-minute information on environmental events in Amazonia and throughout the world. As an effort to further enhance the learning and viewing experience of its visitors, the National Zoo is always undergoing renovations and additions of new exhibits. With new and exciting events and exhibits always happening at the National Zoo, we hope that you will all take the time to go visit our national treasure and take an active approach to protecting and conserving wildlife.